Okay, well, now that we've uh, discussed natural selection and we know the three parameters of that, uh, we just want to quickly touch on, uh, take a look at some real world examples quickly, as well as touch on uh, some specific uh, outcomes of natural selection and far, as far as types of natural selection. So <clears throat> let's remember that the simplest cheesy example I gave in the last video, uh, these coloration of beetles with predatory strange creepy cartoon black looking birds uh, and the fact that they appear to show a preference here for green beetles uh, and along the lines of our premise of natural selection that over time these green beetles would be eaten the tannish orange ish uh, colored beetles would be left over to survive and reproduce and their offspring chances are knowing what we know about genetics and heredity uh, would also be orange uh, so as such, over time, that population of beetles would end up changing, if you will. Um, and granted, these are very, very small changes, but if eventually we lose that green gene from the gene pool, from that population, there are no more green beetles. Uh, we've seen that population change, uh, which, in essence, our definition of evolution is change over time. Uh, so again, now that we've, we've gone, I just, I just want to take a second to look at some... Uh, examples uh, of natural selection because a lot of oftentimes we'll hear arguments from uh, individuals that don't quote unquote believe in evolution um, and they try to attack the theory of natural selection and state that natural selection um, is a f an okay idea but you just there's no evidence for it happening and we can't find examples of that so uh, one example and and as a disclaimer this is not uh, a biased or racist example but some uh, human evolutionary biologists believe that uh, the distribution of normal distribution of human skin color uh, it could actually be an example of natural selection. Now, uh, if we look here, the uh, darker, higher numbers, rather, represent darker skin color. We can see that a uh, majority of darker skin color is here, um, 20 degrees north, 20 degrees south of the equator, approximately with some outliers here obviously falling further south uh, dependent upon geography as well um, and individuals for the most part humans with uh, natural histories in much higher and much lower climates tend to have lighter skin color uh, now if you recall we know that skin color is a result of melanin production which has a protective value uh, protects our cells from ultraviolet radiation so it makes sense that uh, individuals with more melanin production darker skin would have uh, that would be uh, a beneficial trait to them living in areas with high bombardment if you will of, of ultraviolet radiation which is interesting. Uh, we've already, uh, or in class, we've been working on this example, the peppered moths. Remember that prior to the Industrial Revolution, most of the trees had a lightish coloration on them. Uh, in that setting, in that particular environment, the lighter colored moths <coughs> had, are naturally selected, have an advantage uh, where they survive. Darker colored moths stand out a little more, thus they're eaten by predators primarily birds. However, over a very, very quick period of time, uh, through massive amounts of pollution, yay humans, uh, soot um, in particulate matter covered, the undergrowth covered the trees, uh, which turned the background a darker color. Now here we can see the lighter colored moths now stand out a little bit more. So now the darker coloration, those individuals born with uh, darker phenotypes are selected for these moths are selected against. They're eaten at a higher rate. These guys survive, and the population shifts, if you will, back over to a darker end of the spectrum. So one thing that we have to remember, too, is that natural selection and, and evolution as a whole does not have an end in sight. There is no goal with evolution. There's no being perfect with evolution. Evolution just is. Evolution just happens. And what is good at one point in time, at a later point in time, may not be a quote-unquote good trait which is interesting to remember. Uh, here's just a one last quick example. This is one of my favorites. Uh, give you a second here to try and figure out what this is. Go ahead and pause the video and stare at this bad boy and uh, see if you can and uh, identify and figure out what this is and, and how the heck this could be an example of natural selection. So go ahead and take, take a second and try to figure that out. Well, did you figure it out? <laughs> it's not a pair of freaky eyes, although it does look like it. This is actually a close-up to the back wings of, looks pretty furry here, this is a South African speckled peppered moth. Uh, excuse me, 
<laughs> I take that back, sorry, speckled emperor moth. Um, and if you look, these clearly really look like eyes. Now you have to ask yourself as an evolutionary biologist, what would be the benefit of having large eye patches, what look like eyes on your wings? And those are pretty large eyes. They look almost like a, a predatory owl of some sort. And if you're a bird flying in trying to look for small bugs to eat and you see that, that uh, looks very much like a large bird and it's a fantastic defense mechanism. Now just by chance these moths have, have evolved this coloration, this phenotype, which aids them in survival. Those individuals born without these large eyes, I mean come on, even look at the reflective light, it looks just like eyes. Those individuals born without those eye spots or with eye spots that are nowhere near as developed if you on the on their wings uh, would stand less of a chance for survival so again traits that give you a favorable uh, advantage allow you to survive and pass those traits on so I mean we could sit here all day and make a video hours long days long of all the examples of natural selection very simple process we just need to know where to look so just really quickly we want to take a look at three <clears throat> what evolutionary biologists have come up with uh, types, uh, if you will, of natural selection. Um, because if we start to look at populations, we're going to end up seeing that uh, based on environmental conditions, different things, if you will, can happen within certain populations. Our first type of natural selection is called directional selection, uh, which as the name implies, uh, something within our, or a trait rather, a, a distribution within our population is going to shift into one direction. So uh, what we want to look at here in this graph is that this dotted line here shows our uh, original population. Uh, and we've seen this before as a standard bell curve. So let's use an example of, let's say, uh, say mice, for example, small rodents. Uh, and in this population we had at this end some very light colored white mice. Uh, as we go proceed to the right here they get a little bit darker so most of our mice are in the medium end of the spectrum looking at the starting range and then we have some darker mice with very few black colored mice. So for the most part our mice are in the medium colored range with some albinos and some darker colored mice. Now after natural selection uh, or this major selection event has occurred over a short period of time, uh, you can see our distribution has shifted towards the right. Now there are many, many, many more darker colored mice. There are no white colored mice and fewer uh, medium brown colored mice. In this case, something. Nature chose, uh, for some reason, the trait of darker fur being more beneficial, giving them an advantage. They survive, they're young, uh, receive those traits, and the population over time phenotypically, and that's key to note, shifts to one end of the spectrum. It was bad in essence to be lighter colored, it was good to be darker colored. So now in this case we can see what's uh, disruptive selection. This is a little bit different, let's use our mice example again. A few albino mice according to our original uh, population. Uh, some medium, uh, most amount of our mice are medium colored and some darker colored. In this case it's a little bit different. An event, uh, or multiple events rather, have occurred so that now it's actually there's a selection against the mean, the median. There's a selection against having medium colored fur and you can see it's much better. Our lighter colored mice, their population goes way up. The darker colored mice goes way up. For some reason, uh, the trait of being medium brownish colored, the medium end of the coloration spectrum, they were selected against, they went down. Kind of interesting. Um, and again, this could be for multi multiple reasons. Maybe darker guys or lighter guys blend in. Uh, maybe medium color is not uh, sexually attractive. Maybe mice don't want to mate with the brown colored mice. Uh, whatever the reason may be, it is natural selection. Uh, favorable traits increase, less favorable traits decrease. And the last example is the opposite of disruptive, is stabilizing selection. Uh, and we can see that it's same sample, same scenario rather, let's start with the mice, some light colored, mostly medium colored here in our original population and some darker colored mice. Here it's the opposite of disruptive. For some reason the medium coloration is favored, their population skyrockets and we see a pinching in. The lighter colored mice disappear, the darker colored mice 
disappear. Uh, so we can say our population has stabilized towards the middle phenotype. In every case, there's a, a shift from original population to a different uh, makeup of that population. Now again, we're not talking, I'm saying I'm growing a third arm or a fourth set of wings or an extra eye. That is not what evolution is. In this case, we're looking at what's called microevolution, small changes in populations.